Welcome to Thursday's edition of COVID-19. Concerns continue here in Korea amid sporadic outbreaks nationwide. The daily tally stands at above 300 yet again, and almost a third of those new infections have been recorded here in the capital city. And speaking of Seoul, level 1.5 social distancing is in effect here as of today. So do seek to abide by the enhanced safety guidelines. We start the program now with our Kwon so So we're we looking at yet another rise in new infections here in Korea for this Thursday. That's right, Sunny. We are seeing 30 more infections compared to yesterday, meaning 343 new cases, which is the highest figure in 83 days when the nation was dealing with a massive outbreak in the capital region, mainly related to a rally in the capital, Seoul. Now, domestic transmissions have also risen close to 300, and uh, imported cases have dropped by 18 from Thursday, but still at a relatively high level. Now, for the entire week, we are seeing that the cases are on a steady rising trend. And for the second straight day, the number were in the 300s. And also for six days, the figure has been at over 200. And that brings the total here in the nation to 29,654. 498 people have so far lost their lives from COVID-19. And also the number of people in quarantine or under treatment has surpassed 3,000. Right, so and against those grim numbers, we have enhanced social distancing measures in place in quite a few places here in the country. Right, Sunny. After the government's announcement earlier this week, now we are having stricter rules related to the number of people who can gather simultaneously, as well as stricter preventative guidelines at uh, designated venues, which are not necessarily high risk facilities. So these will be in place for two weeks now, in tandem with a special virus prevention period ahead of the National uh, College uh, Entrance Exam, or Sunung, on December 3rd. Now, uh, let's take a look at our map now. Where are these new measures now in effect? First off, here in the capital, Seoul, which has uh, meanwhile surpassed 7,000 cases with 109 added this Thursday. So Seoul and Gyeonggi-do province will be under 1.5 uh, level measures, as well as parts of Gangwon-do province and also Gwangju, uh, which have implemented uh, these measures independently and beginning next Monday Incheon will also be under level 1.5 social distancing measures and we do see a lot of regions that have double digit figures this Thursday while we also as I said before have a, a quite a large number of imported cases with 39 detected at the nation's airport or seaports so let's take a look at the global situation over 56.5 million uh, in, in infections with over 600 18,000 reported in the span of 24 hours, also over 11,400 fatalities in a day. And uh, with the countries here, uh, the 20 countries with the highest number of infections, we're seeing here 11.8 million in the U.S. India is also seeing another uptick in cases. And Poland here has surpassed the total number of infections of South Africa in the past day. And uh, let's take a look at some of the countries with the highest rises in the past day, 178,000 in the U.S., 34,000 new cases in Italy and also Germany with over 20,800 new infections. And those are the updates I have for now. I'll be back with more after the government briefing. Sunny. All right, so I thank you for that for now. Now back here in the country, the National Health Insurance Service is now covering the combined cost of testings for both COVID-19 and the flu. For details on this, I have our Kim Dami here in the studio. Welcome, Tami. Good afternoon, Sunny. Tami, so let's begin with the free dual test. Right, so the expanded coverage for testing has now come into effect starting today. So dual-purpose RT-PCR tests will be used, which can detect both COVID-19 and influenza at the same time. Testing is strongly recommended for anyone who is experiencing suspected symptoms. Starting this Thursday, the cost of the testing will be fully covered by national health insurance, despite the country experiencing a mild flu season thus far. Let's take a listen. Starting tomorrow, tests that can simultaneously diagnose both COVID-19 and the flu will be covered by the National Health Insurance Service. This is a precautionary step, even though an influenza advisory has not been issued so far. 
Now, the dual-purpose RT-PCR test kits are quite handy in distinguishing COVID-19 patients from those with the flu, given the similarity in symptoms like coughing and fever. Test results are ready within three to six hours and cost as much as roughly 85 U.S. dollars. It'll be fully covered by the National Health Insurance Service and the Korea Disease Control and Prevention Agency, so no out-of-pocket expenses on your end. Korean health authorities could also extend the duration of coverage depending on the flu situation here in the country. I see. That's good to know. Uh, Tommy, speaking of health insurance, I understand there's been an extension in date for those hoping to get their regular medical checkup. Exactly. So if you want to go in for a checkup, you can now do so until June. The decision was made to prevent overcrowding at medical centers amid the pandemic. Korea's health ministry said on Wednesday the extension is a part of efforts to contain the outbreak and ensure safety at the country's hospitals and clinics. Similar steps were taken back in 2005 when MERS broke out, when the due date for medical checkups was also extended until March 2006. But local health authorities are still encouraging those with respiratory symptoms to get their checkup within the year as they are more vulnerable to the coronavirus. Right. And I understand authorities here have reiterated their intentions to secure a proper supply of vaccines for the public. Right, so the Korean government says it aims to distribute vaccines to 30 million people by next year. It says it is negotiating with pharmaceutical companies for some 20 million doses, and vaccines for the other 10 million have already been secured through the COVAX facility, a global initiative to allow equal access to COVID-19 vaccines. We are currently negotiating with all of the leading vaccine makers and we don't expect major difficulties in reaching our goal. South Korean Health Minister Pang Nung hoo also said on Tuesday that Pfizer and Moderna, which recently reported that their vaccine candidates were over 90 percent effective, are also trying to reach a deal with South Korea. He added that it'll be easy to uh, secure vaccines from AstraZeneca, another pharmaceutical giant, because its vaccines are being domestically produced. And Korea appears to be emerging as a production hub for COVID-19 vaccines and treatments, as local firms have signed a series of deals uh, to manufacture vaccines on behalf of other global companies. For instance, Samsung Biologic has already manufactured a small volume of antibody treatment for COVID-19 with U.S.-based firm Eli Lilly. Local rival SK Bioscience has also signed agreements to produce COVID-19 vaccines with AstraZeneca and U.S. firm Novavax. The government will be announcing details on how it plans to secure vaccines later this month. Right, Tommy, one final question before you go. As Soa mentioned, we have two weeks left the National College entrance exam. Tell us a bit about the preparations underway to ensure safety at test venues. Right, so as it involves hundreds of thousands of students, both education and health ministries are, are on high alert, especially amid the latest surge in cases. That means more students may be in self-quarantine when the test day rolls around. Almost half a million students will be taking the exam this year. The Education Ministry is not only setting up regular exam sites, but also isolated test centers for those in self-quarantine, as well as those who've tested positive for COVID-19. So far, they'll be able to accommodate 120 confirmed patients and 3,800 people in self-quarantine. There'll be also rooms for students who show COVID-19 symptoms on the day of the test. For regular test takers, only 24 students will be allowed in one room. Also, the education minister has designated the time frame from today to December 3rd as a special disease prevention period. Containment efforts will be strengthened, including regular disinfection of public use facilities and other locations that are often visited by students. And parents and peers will not be able to cheer on the test takers on the exam day, which is an annual tradition due to concerns over the outbreak. All right, Tommy, as always, thank you for that coverage. Hope to see you again soon. My pleasure. Right, we turn now to the regular government briefing on COVID-19 here in Korea for this Thursday. Right, I understand the briefing has... Oh, the briefing is about to start. We'll come back to you afterwards with a summary of it. First of all, we have Mr. Lee Sang-won with a briefing. COVID-19 
Let us now begin our regular briefing on the COVID-19 situation here in South Korea. As of November 19th, we have a total of 293 new uh, local infections and 50 new imported cases. Uh, the total case load now stands at 29,654. And currently we have a total of 3,058 people in quarantine and 79 patients with severe or critical conditions. And as of yesterday, we had two additional fatalities with the accumulated death toll standing at 498. I extend my deepest condolences to the deceased and the members of the bereaved families. Let us now take a look at the major updates on our domestic infections by region. Starting from Seoul City, in relation to a university in Seodaemungu district, we had the first index case being confirmed on the 16th, and we have 11 new uh, more cases, and a total of 12 have been confirmed to date. And in Seoul, Dobonggu district, in relation to a religious institute, we had the first index case being identified on 15th, and we have 23 more people uh, being confirmed pay, uh, positive, and also uh, a total of 24 people have been confirmed so far. And in Seoul, the Seochogu district, we have the uh, religious institute and we have the uh, first index case being confirmed on the 16th of November. We have 11 more cases being confirmed, a total of uh, 12 people have been confirmed to date. And also in relation to an alumni sports group uh, in the uh, metropolitan area, we also had the first index case being confirmed on the 14th of this month, and we have nine additional cases, raising the total to 10. And in Gyeonggi-do province, in relation to a singing room in Kimpo City, we had the first index case being confirmed on the 16th of November, and we have nine additional cases, raising the total to 10 as of now. And in Gyeongnam, Hadong, uh, Hadong City, we have the uh, middle school, and we have 11 more cases being confirmed, uh, raising the total to 21. And in relation to a village in Suncheon City in Jeonnam province, we also have the first index case identified on the 17th of November. We have nine additional cases, raising the total to a total of 10. And in relation to a, a nursing facility in the Cholon city of Gangwon-do province, we also had the first index case identified earlier this month, and we have seven additional cases, raising the total to eight. And as for other cluster infections, if you have any further inquiries, please contact uh, the uh, spokesperson's office for detailed information. As we ne uh, near the winter season, we are very much concerned of a twindemic of the coinciding of the uh, COVID-19 as well as influenza outbreak. And we will also like to provide more detailed information for COVID, uh, the influenza virus. And we have also uh, provided a guideline, and this will be implemented starting from today. And all of the hospitals, they are advised to take uh, reservations online uh, in advance and also so making uh, depending on uh, the uh, the guidance of the doctors, they can also conduct uh, the patients to go to the screening clinic to get tested. And also, as for inpatients, uh, they also uh, will have to uh, be diagnosing them based on uh, these guidelines and measures. And also, they can. Uh, uh, prescribe the antiviral drugs if they are suspicious of uh, influenza virus. And starting from today, for uh, the um, children, the elderly, as well as those with weak immune systems, we will ensure the health coverage, health insurance coverage of the uh, antiviral drugs. And also, they will be given a report uh, that would also um, have enabled them to have swift testings for COVID-19 without uh, having to wait in a line. And we have a streamlined uh, this process. As of now, globally, we are seeing a massive outbreak of the COVID-19, and there are uh, no positive signs of containing the virus as of yet. After mid-November, as of now, uh, globally, we have on 
daily uh, on daily case uh, on a daily average we have uh, more than 500,000 to 600,000 on a daily uh, basis and compared to just September two months ago this is double uh, the number and uh, compared to May it is uh, more than six folds and this is not only uh, limited to uh, certain nations however they are commonly seen in all of uh, most of the countries uh, in the northern hemisphere and it also uh, has pretty much in line with the uh, weather as well and uh, the spread of uh, the other uh, uh, respiratory diseases. And in Korea, we are also having a rapid surge of the COVID-19. And in among the OECD countries, uh, we were the lowest lowest three countries with the uh, average number of uh, COVID-19 patients per every one million. However, we are seeing a rapid surge in the virus and the situation is a very worrisome. And here in Korea, most of the cases are clustered in the metropolitan area and the sources of infection range from uh, group meetings, office spaces, as well as um, other um, multi-use facilities. And uh, we have seen a major transmissions through the communi community. We already know very well uh, which uh, uh, the behaviors and actions are at uh, increase our risks of uh, the COVID-19 infections and which are very effective in preventing uh, the further spread. And right now, the quarantine authorities is focusing our more efforts on containing the virus, including uh, the detection as well as the tracing of the patients. However, uh, the public's participation is ever more important. What I would like to highlight is the fact that it is very important to have an early diagnosis of the COVID-19, and because COVID-19 can spread uh, at a very fast pace, even before you have symptoms, it is a very crucial. And also, even before you have symptoms, uh, it can spread the virus for days. And therefore, early testing is a very important for the safety of all. So if you have any suspicious symptoms, please go to the screening clinic as soon as possible. If not, you also could spread the virus to many people who are who will be posed at the risks of um, uh, infection and being exposed to the virus. Moreover, if you are in need of uh, the testings, uh, we also uh, need to have a good um, and a kind and considerate social um, uh, ambience as well. And uh, we, note, we need to note that anyone can get infected by the COVID-19. However, we shall not stigmatize uh, those who have been confirmed with the patients. Uh, also, if there are many people who are uh, not being able to uh, get tested because of these social uh, stigma. Uh, all of these burdens will come back to our society as a whole. So it is important uh, that every one of us have the uh, power and the energy to contain the virus for the sake of our community as a whole. So we ask you to get tested if you have uh, symptoms, and please encourage others who are around you. In addition, recently the COVID-19 uh, patients are seeing uh, are seeing a rapid s spread and rapid surge, and there are also fake news and rumors about the spread of fake information, especially on the number of daily infections. Currently, we are seeing accelerated community transmissions, and the nation is currently uh, intensifying its uh, efforts right now on a nationwide um, scheme. And however, there are many uh, actions of, of rumors, of fake news, and this does not only hinder the quarantine authorities' uh, efforts, but it also hinders and put at, puts at risk the safety and the health of the public. And also, we believe that this situation is a very grave and it is a very critical moment. And we are assessing all of the uh, sources of uh, infection, and we are also uh, disclosing all of the related information in a transparent manner. So we ask you to refrain from going to um, non-essential gatherings and always wear your face mask. Right, that was Lee sang at the Central Disease Control Headquarters, Soa, with Thursday's afternoon briefing. What did he have to say?
Uh, let's start with the updates on some of the cluster infections that we are seeing in recent days. Uh, in the capital Seoul, there's uh, been new infections related to a university and also at religious facilities, as well as uh, cases that emerged during sports activities as well. And also in Gyeonggi-do province, there is a new cluster infection related to a singing room. In Gyeongsangnam-do province, in the south of the nation, uh, middle school students were infected as well well as more cases in a village in Jeollanamdo province. Also in Gangwon-do province, there have been additional cases related to a daycare center. And uh, you can see how uh, the officials no longer mention each and every single case, which means we have too many of those cluster infections uh, in the recent weeks. That's why uh, E asked for cooperation from the nation's people, especially uh, if they do feel any uh, symptoms, even before symptoms, if they are are suspicious of having been at a place where they could have been exposed to the virus. They should get tested for the virus. And he also mentioned that there have been some uh, rumors and fake news related to the numbers of COVID-19 cases. And uh, he stressed that this hinders quarantine efforts as well as the nation's uh, affects the nation's public's uh, safety as well. Uh, in the meantime, uh, when it comes to the surge in global figures, Korea seems to be on the uh, better uh, front when it comes to daily COVID-19 cases as uh, out of the OECD countries, Korea was in the lower uh, three uh, members with the lowest number of infections, but still the spread is going on. So we need uh, more cooperation from everyone, especially with the level 1.5 social distancing measures in effect around the capital region. Right, so I thank you for that. Right, and speaking of the 1.5 social distancing measures which are in effect here in the capital uh, city and in a few other places around the country, we'll take a moment now to actually look at some of those uh, guidelines. Under level point one, that is, mask wearing is mandatory for all those above the age of 14 with exceptions for those suffering from medical conditions that can be aggravated by face masks. Now do remember that violators can face fines of up to 100,000 won. Gatherings of more than 500 people need to be approved by relevant authorities and venues that host such large-scale events need to abide by stringent safety measures under level 1.5. Workplaces are encouraged to adopt remote working and those that cannot do so have to rearrange working spaces to allow for proper social distancing among workers. Sports stadiums fesh, uh, face that is a fresh limit on crowd capacity at 30%. Now this is the same for regular religious services, a limit of 30% on those in attendance. Now while regular sermons can take place, do remember that small gatherings including meal sharing are banned. Schools, meanwhile, can accommodate two thirds of their student body. Now, with regard to safety rules at public places, venues that fall under special watch category, including nightlife establishments such as clubs and bars, singing rooms and restaurants, have to limit their number of patrons and implement strict arrangements that take into account social distancing. Venues that fall under the regular watch category, including performance centers, movie theaters, gyms, cram schools, amusement parks and malls, hold the discretion to decide for themselves the limit of patrons depending on their specific circumstances but measures with regard to safety and prevention need to be strictly followed other public facilities have to abide by a capacity cap of between 20 and 50 percent now social welfare facilities including those for the elderly and those for toddlers need to follow stringent hygiene and safety practices regular ventilation and frequent disinfection of commonly touched surfaces are being recommended at all indoor and public spaces up next, we take a look at public efforts to fight plastic pollution amid the pandemic by promoting awareness and prompting action to take a look. This is Im Hyunju, a resident in the city of Paju, north of Seoul, who is trying to cut down on her use of disposable plastic. She's always putting the environment first, even when she's grabbing a cup of coffee. Hyunju keeps a daily record of her use of disposable plastic, and she is deeply worried about the world's plastic waste problem, which has been exacerbated by the COVID-19 pandemic. Corona로 인해서 큰 변화 없지만 세상이 변화하고 있어서 제가 신경 쓰고 있는 게 뭐가 한세 가지 정도 되는 것 같아요. 하나는 물수, 물티슈예요. 그다음에는 
종이컵이 위생이라는 이름으로 물 마시는 용으로 종이컵이 다 빛이 돼 있어요. 어느 순간 모든 식당 이름이 다 그렇게 변했더라고요. 그리고 또 하나는 그 빨대. 안 쓰면 살아도 아무런 불편함이 없는데 어느 순간 너무 편하게 그런 것을 아무렇지 않게 쓰게 되는 경우가 있는데 이런 세 가지 정도만 줄여도 우리가 플라스틱을 많이 줄일 수 있지 않을까 생각이 들고 COVID-19 has triggered a surge in plastic waste and they go beyond face masks and medical equipment. The problem is being fueled by disposable food packaging with more people eating takeout and delivery as well as the easing of regulations on single-use plastics for hygiene purposes amid the pandemic. 시켜 먹는 배달 음식이 많다 보니까 숟가락이나 막 일회용품 이런 게좀 많이 버리게 되는 것 같습니다. 아무래도 코로나 때문에 좀 위생적인 측면에서 좀더 일회용품을 찾게 되는 것 같은데 그게 환경에 안 좋은 거를 알고 있으니까 좀 마음이 불편한 것 같습니다. Some eco-conscious citizens have started a movement to reduce plastic waste in their community, collecting the plastic lids that are found in many canned meat products. 우리가 이제 실제로 만나서 얘기를 들은 결과 점차적으로 없애는 방안을 추진 중이라고. 굉장히 많은 분들이 아 이런 걸 몰랐다 나도 이렇게 얘기를 할수 있구나라든지 소비자들이 이런 거를 목소리를 내야겠다는 생각을 이번에 하게 됐다고 많은 분들이 말씀을 해주시거든요. There is also a campaign that collects single-use plastic straws that come with the packaging of many drinks. In response, one beverage maker even put out collection boxes for the plastic straws in question. After being collected, the straws are upcycled and reused to make these dolls. 기업이 바로 역할을 할수 있는 게 뭐가 있을까 같이 고민을 하다가 캠페인을 같이 한번 진행을 해봤으면 좋겠다라는 의견을 주셔서 캠페인을 진행하게 됐습니다. 그래서 저희가 진행한 캠페인은 Save the Earth라는 캠페인을 진행했는데 다양한 협업을 통해서 더 많은 친환경 캠페인을 진행할 예정입니다. With modern day consumers becoming more environmentally conscious than ever before, the corporate sector has also turned more proactive in generating less plastic and other wastes. 맥도날드 같은 회사들이 이제 뭐 플라스틱 빨대를 없애는 활동 그런 걸 통해서 이제 친환경 소비자, 특히 밀레니얼 소비자들의 반응을 긍정적으로 받고 있고요. 그런데 자극을 받아서 우리나라 더 많은 기업들이 이제 그 플라스틱 아니라 종이 빨대라든지 이제 그 폐기물 관리라든지 이런 데더 신경을 써서 친환경 기업으로 더한 걸음 더 나아가는 기회가 됐다 이렇게 생각합니다. The use of disposable plastic is unsustainable for the environment, and we must be willing to set aside some of our conveniences. to ensure a cleaner and greener earth for future generations to enjoy. Today, November 19th, is the World Day for Prevention of Child Abuse. And in today's studio session, we explore the plight faced by the young amid the pandemic. I have Oh Jun, current chairperson of Save the Children Korea and former Korean ambassador to the UN. Welcome to the studio, Mr. Oh. Good to be here. I also have Cornelius Williams, Global Chief of Child Protection at UNICEF. Pleasure to have you with us, Mr. Williams, virtually. Thank you very much. I'd like to extend my first general question to both of you. What has been the impact of COVID-19 on children's rights over the past 10 months? Perhaps we can start here in the studio, Mr. O. Well, by now, uh, it looks like uh, that the, this uh, pandemic situation will be recorded as the biggest crisis 
faced by humanity in our generation, and its economic impact is enormous. The United Nations has recently reported that for the first time in 20 years, the global population in extreme poverty will increase again, almost by 100 million people. When we have this kind of negative impact, usually, uh, you know, uh, it, it is more harsh on, on vulnerable groups in our society, which include children. Um, the, the negative impact on children's rights, children's well-being uh, is all over the areas, including child rearing, safety, and education. Um, by now, I think we can say that this uh, pandemic crisis is turning fast into a broader child rights crisis. I see. Mr. Williams, would you agree with this rather dismal picture given to us by Mr. O? Yes, we have a child rights crisis. We have a crisis within a crisis. We have the COVID-19 pandemic and we have a child rights crisis. That is a hidden crisis that we have now started to see. There are common themes that are emerging across the countries and contexts as we move to the close of 2020. What we are seeing actually is that the school closure, the childcare closure, the confinement in home, the sudden and yet pro prolonged socioeconomic shocks, the reduced availability and access to services that children need has a, has a significant risk for children. In addition to the possible health risk itself, there are some direct risks which I'd like to mention. The negative mental health effect of staying at home restriction, the increased violence and abuse against children, the increased risk to online violence, and the, you know, and the disruption of the education. And we will talk about it, I'm sure. There are issues about increased child marriage, female genital mutilation, increased child labor, so, and there are special groups, actually, he spoke about the inequality. The pandemic has been an, a, a dis showing this equality amongst children. For instance, children without family care, those who are in residential care, those who are displaced by war, those who are migrating, those who are seeking asylum, those with disability, deprived of their liberty, all these children have been uh, really affected, actually, and their rights, they're now, their rights are being denied. Right, a very shocking picture, of course. Mr. O, so the pandemic has led to an actual rise in child abuse then? Yes, um, according to a survey by Save the Children uh, on, the, uh, on the impact of COVID-19 on children's lives, uh, in 37 countries surveyed, the, the number of child abuses, uh, you know, uh, which accounted for 8% of, of, of all domestic violence in the past, is now, has now jumped to 17%, so almost two-fold increase. And we, in Korea, we also have similar uh, data statistics that uh, the, the, the reported child abuse cases um, increased almost by 20% uh, during this year. I see. Mr. Williams, reports of child abuse are not confined to one particular country. They appear to be a brutal universal reality. Now, what do you suppose is the reason behind the rise in such atrocities amid this pandemic? You're right. Before the pandemic, three in four children between the ages of two and four receive violent discipline by the parents and other primary givers. So it has exacerbated it. Let me mention what we call the toxic trio. Domestic abuse, substance use, a parent or caregiver with mental health. If you have these trios, you usually have violence in the home and children suffer from abuse. And the issues about this abuse is that with the parents confined at home, with the stressors that they were going through, we had seen a rise in child abuse, right? Because actually, again, as I said, you have the toxic grill. In addition to that, the workers who should be in contact with these children are not in contact with the children. Okay, so we did an analysis 
And when we looked actually, we saw that over two thirds of the country that had um, services for violence against children were disrupted. Our analysis were in 104 countries that cover 1.8 billion children. And in these countries, actually, the services had been disrupted. Um, what we saw that home visits were not being done by the social service workers, uh, the justice workers were not able to go out as well. And if the social service workers who should be looking at these children were not in contact, then again, actually, how can we protect these children? I see. Mr. O, I understand the pandemic is also giving way to certain types of child abuse. Could you please elaborate? Well, as far as Korea is concerned, we can see at least three uh, typical uh, patterns of child abuse rising. Um, first, um, um, because, uh, you know, uh, children don't go to school, school is closed, so they have to spend a lot of time at home and their caregivers, uh, quite often parents, uh, fears a great deal of burden from that, so they are stressed, and that leads to child abuses. And second case, I think, um, you know, a lot of children are neglected, uh, what you call maltreatment, because some parents cannot afford to have uh, uh, an extended, um, you know, leave uh, for, for taking care of their children, and from their work, I mean. And, and also some single parents, you know, they, they have to uh, kind of leave their children alone at home, um, which is sometimes illegal, but that happens. So that's another case pattern of child abuse. And the last one, probably it is more typical for teenagers. So they spend more time online and they are exposed to uh, harmful contents online and there are a lot of uh, cases of uh, abuses and cri even online crimes. Right, and we'll get that in, into that in a little bit. But first, Mr. Williams, staying with the different types of child abuse, I understand that the Ebola outbreak in West Africa from 2014 to 2016, for example, led to a surge in child labor and teenage pregnancies, forced marriages as well. What's more, a greater number of children under the age of five back then died amid the lack of essential care than the total number of people who died from Ebola. Is this the appalling reality that we are poised to face in the case of a prolonged COVID-19 pandemic? With the prolonged pandemic and the prolonged containment at home and the prolonged disruption of service, what we are seeing is that there is going to likely be an increase in child marriage. There is going to be a likely increase in um, the number of children who are um, working as child laborers. Uh, we feel that there would be a rollback on the progress that has been made in both child marriage and um, child labor, and we will not be able to meet the SDG target. We anticipate, actually, that a lot of um, increase in sexual exploitation and abuse online because children are spending most of their time learning, socializing, and playing online. So we are expecting... We hope that it will not turn out that way, but we're expecting that actually there would be a deterioration. In, in the Ebola, from the Ebola lessons learned from the Ebola experience, actually there was an increase in child marriage, there was an increase in sexual abuse and exploitation of girls. I see. And given that scenario, Mr. O, what are your suggestions for dealing with the absence of child care protection services amid such health crises? Well, I, I think uh, both the government and uh, child care agencies uh, should go for more uh, flexible uh, measures. And in the case of government, flexible policy measures, um, including by applying, um, for example, more tailor-made approach to the so-called uh, group of higher risk you know, when, when, when there, are, there is a, a higher risk of child abuse, like if, uh, for, for example, children in foster home, children with disabilities, children 
uh, in extreme poverty. All of them are very vulnerable. So rather than uh, you know, taking a one-size-fits-all approach, we need to have more flexible, have more tailor-made approaches to these different groups. And for example, Save the Children Korea is uh, conducting a kind of uh, uh, in-person uh, uh, management, which, which we call in-person management, which is about, you know, sometimes they visit uh, the, the children uh, that are vulnerable, uh, rather than having them all together in a group. I see. But such efforts, of course, have been rendered difficult because of social distancing. That's true. Yeah. I see. Mr. Williams, another form of child abuse is that which occurs online, including exposure to obscenity, as uh, Mr. O had mentioned earlier, and other, of course, inappropriate materials or even interaction, online interaction, that is inappropriate. What can be done, Mr. Williams, to better address this problem? So this is an all of society response to keep children safe online. One of the first thing actually we should do is to support the parents and caregivers and schools to help children who are online to stay safe by being alert to any sign of distress that may emerge with children online activities. Then we have to ensure that the platforms that these children are using, right, uh, are safe actually and have protective measures. And they can reach out to help if they encounter any distress online then we have to strengthen national efforts. Governments have to respond to prevent and respond and to seek justice for any online sexual exploitation and abuse. This is not the time for governments to um, let down, to um, weaken their regulations. This is a time for them to strengthen their regulations and vigilance. Then the children themselves have to be empowered with the knowledge. So empower the parents with knowledge empower the children with knowledge, and then get the government to maintain, actually, the regulations. I see. Mr. O, does Korea have a safety net to better protect its minors against cyber abuse? Or does your entity have a campaign to address the issues of cyber abuse? Yes, uh, we are doing that. Um, in Korea, as you know, uh, there is great popularity of uh, uh, YouTubes. And, um, you know, um, in some cases, they feature children in their, in their YouTube posting uh, in a negative way, you know. Sometimes they, they force their children to do something really uh, absurd or funny, depending on your view, and which is actually kind of child abuse. So we, we sued some of them, and they were actually sentenced to guilty. I see. Mr. Williams, another unfortunate fallout amid the pandemic is the challenge to a productive academic experience. Not only are some children forced to adopt remote learning, others cannot afford to access its digital means of education altogether. What are your thoughts? Well, first of all, it's not only the productive uh, academic learning school, actually, we're a protective uh, factor, actually, in children's life. Teachers were the first people who would notice if a child had a problem. In addition to that, actually, as we had said before, um, this uh, epidemic, actually, the pandemic has shown actually that COVID is, uh, is a big desequalizer. So as the executive director has highlighted, that a near ubiquitous decision by 92% of all countries to temporarily close school and move to remote learning has shown the glaring inequality, including access to online and digital learning. Even when children have the technology and tools at home, they, they may not be able to learn. A lot of children were not able to learn because of competing pressures, doing work at home, being a poor environment for learning, lack of support, their parents were not able to support them. So one of the things actually we have done is to see how schools could have, we could have safe reopening of schools. And we have a framework for that, the framework for reopening schools that was done by UNESCO, UNHCR, WFP and World Bank. And it lays it all out how we can do that. So suddenly the world knew that schools were a critical place. All the parents who were working, who had their kids in school and the teachers were the caregivers, 
they don't have that anymore. So it's not only about their academics and the next generation, but it's also about childcare. I see. Mr. O, given those hardships, what efforts are being made by your agency to better assist children in need? Well, we, we kind of uh, made a special appeal to Korean public to support us uh, so that we can support these uh, children in crisis. And we got quite good public response. Actually, Save the Children Korea uh, collected about $2 million while Save the Children Global uh, collected almost uh, $70 million worldwide. And we are providing assistance to children both in and outside Korea. I see. Mr. Williams, also, as you mentioned earlier, of course, people are claiming the pandemic may undo decades of efforts to, to advance children's rights and to ensure uh, gender equality. Uh, what is your agency doing to ensure that reality? A very brief response, please, Mr. Williams. Well, the brief response is actually we are working with different agencies to put um, systems in place. And I can just give you a few figures, OK? With the work that we have been able to do, we have been able to provide over 400,000 children with alternative care who didn't have parents. 20 million children have had access to safe channels to report sexual exploitation and abuse. 74 million children and more have been access to mental health. So we have been working with government, pivoting their service to digital services, getting governments to recognize that social workers are essential workers and the government uh, and put in special programs, building their programs into the national response. So child rights should be in every national response for the COVID. Right, Mr. Williams, some remarkable numbers there. Thank you very much for your time today. And Mr. O, thank you for being with us today. Thank you. Right, Thank well, that is, that is all the time we have for today. We'll be back tomorrow at the SAR uh, with more on the pandemic here and elsewhere around the world. In the meantime, do take care and do remember that the enhanced social distancing guidelines are in place here in Seoul starting today.